Hello, everyone. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Hi. Um, it's so great to see uh, such a good audience here at this bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. And there's coffee outside if you, uh, if you didn't see, and a lot of good Danishes, too. I had some of the coffee. It's pretty good. Um, we're going to start right now. And Samantha, if you would tell people out in the hall that we're starting. Um, we started planning this uh, event uh, really almost a year ago because we had to reach out to some of these speakers and get, get, get it on their calendar, and it's very great that they were able to do this. And our first speaker, uh, we're going to have two panels on climate communications this morning, then have lunch. And uh, anybody who hasn't registered yet, you can go out during the break between this panel and the next one and uh, register at that time. Um, to welcome you all this morning, the first, the first two panels I said are going to be on climate communication, and to welcome you all here, and then I'm going to uh, call up the panelists for the first panel, uh, is uh, Ann Chester. Ann is the director of a great program uh, here at WVU, run out of the School of Medicine, called HISTA, the Health Sciences and Technology Academy. And uh, over uh, a decade, I'd say, or maybe more than that, uh, they have uh, done sort of uh, in science enrichment education in West Virginia schools, but they uh, combine it with a, a, a wonderful program of scholarship assistance for students who go on, and Ann will tell you something about it. Uh, obviously, uh, a, client, a science literate population is really helpful to making progress on climate change. And I've had a, the great honor of uh, doing science education programs, hands-on stuff in front of um, their HISTA clubs in schools around West Virginia for the last couple of years has been probably one of the most uh, rewarding things I've ever done. Please make welcome Ann Chester. Good morning, everybody. It is wonderful to see you here. Welcome to the National Energy Conference 2018. And the topic today is climate issues. This is, this is the most important topic that I can think of. This is the topic that impacts our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren. And if there's a person in this room is, who's not concerned about their kids, I don't know them. This is a time that is really important to put all of our energies towards figuring out how to use our assets to make a difference in the future. You and I were born into the Anthropocene, the Anthropocene, however you want to speak about this. The Anthropocene is when humans, Homo sapiens, are having the biggest impact on our planet in the history of the planet. No one species has ever impacted the globe like we are now. It is one of our gifts as a species, gifts in quotes. But another one of our gifts, this is something that is peculiar only to Homo sapiens as we know it, is the ability to create governments, religions, movements, organizes, organizations, cooperations. This is our gift. This is a chance to use our gift because we are going to have to adapt, create, adopt new strategies. We're going to need to organize across diversities of people, diversities of countries, diversity of ages, diversities of interests. I know right now is not necessarily a time when we think we're very good at it, but really in actuality we are, as a species, really good at this. So for our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren, we'd better bring this skill to the forefront and put away the me attitude. That's an attitude that genetically we're wired to have. But we need to override our circuitry, our genetic circuitry, and develop another habit we also have, another genetic circuitry wiring, the we attitude. The we attitude so that we can look at ourselves in relationship to the entire globe 
and to look at ourselves in relationship to not only the people that we love directly, but the people around the globe, and not just people, but animals and plants and the rest of it. We are not alone on this planet. We cannot exist alone on this planet. And the me attitude has got us thinking that we're doing a pretty good job and in actuality. Um, Tom can tell you it's not as good as we would hope for our kids. So I want to challenge everybody in this room today to pull out the genetic circuitry of the we attitude and figure out how to collaborate. We all come with different skills. We all come with different passions. We, have, we all come with different beliefs. And we all come with different willingnesses. And we can bring this diversity together. And West Virginia is a perfect place to do it. I mean, we've got a history of being leaders. The first thing we can do is to figure out how to work together so that we can figure out how to adapt, how to change, how to create infrastructure so that, so that the future is more guaranteed for our great, 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 great grandchildren. And I want to tell you why I'm passionate about it. Um, well, first of all, probably not even Tom knows this, but I was studying climate change back in 1980, 1977, 78, 79, in the Arctic. Yeah. I did my research in Alaska, in the Tussock Tundra, and I traveled up and down the pipeline looking at the impact of climate change. So I doubt if he even kn knows that. So I have a passion that comes from 30 plus years. But my passion is also in the understanding that kids are our vectors of change. And through kids, if we can get our kids to understand and to help and to adapt and to create, that our chances of success are even higher. So as a part of this, I have developed with a lot, a lot, a lot of help this program that Tom was talking about, the Health Sciences and Technology Academy. It was born in 1994. And so in West Virginia is the only place that this exists. The purpose for this is to get kids who are often overlooked, kids who come from backgrounds who don't think they're ever going to college, don't think they have a chance to get into college, capture them in the ninth grade. Capture them in the ninth grade and show them what it takes to be successful, to be a part of a family, to be a part of a movement, and to go to college and to go back into West Virginia as STEM professionals to live and work. So since 1994, we are very happy to say that we have graduated over 2,700 of these kids, kids from foster homes, from homes whose families have never gone to college, from African American and other minority groups that you don't see in college as much as we should. Kids from the first in their family, from the poorest of the poor, 800 at a time, we take them in the ninth grade only and then grow them up through the 12th grade. And at the end, if they have done research every single year, immerse themselves in fixing community problems from which they grow up in, and then they do that four years and come to two different college summer camps. At the end of that, they get a tuition waiver. Thank you. And this comes from the West Virginia legislature. There is, this happened because of collaboration. Collaboration across the aisles. It was voted 100% by that back in 1997 to give these kids a tuition waiver, not only in the undergraduate years, but all the way through medical school, dental school, pharmacy school, nursing, and STEM PhDs. And this happens not just at WVU, but at Marshall, all across, and, and Concord, and Glenville, and State, and you know, and so all the pu public institutions provide this tuition waiver. The outcome of this has been that 62% of them end up in STEM careers. Well, first of all, 99% go to college. 99% go to college. And 91% graduate with a degree. Now, that is unheard of. The four-year degrees, 87% of them. And, and if you look 
87% graduating with a four-year degree in West Virginia is like twice what happens to the normal everyday population. So we have broken the sound barrier by paying attention to these kids at the ninth grade and growing their ability to, to make a difference in their communities, to become STEM literate, and to love their community because now they, it matters to them. They see they can make a difference. That mattering. And they are now concerned they are now concerned about climate change as well, more concerned because they have an understanding that they are a part of the problem. So with this in mind, that we have this massive organization, I want to put this out here for you as a challenge. Are there ways that you can collaborate with the Health Sciences and Technology Academy? And if not the Health Sciences and Technology Academy, then some other organization in this room to generate a bigger forward motion to make a difference in our future for our great-great-grandchildren. I want to tell you the impact on the HISTA kids from just one collaboration with, with Tom over the last two years. He's had, well, I think it was last year, Tom, wasn't it, that you had over 200 kids at a time? Uh, um, like your 400. 400, okay, so 400 kids. And these are kids that I had described the background they come from. Climate change is not the first thing on their mind. Mostly it's, where am I going to get clothes? How am I going to find my next mouth food, food for, the, my, for my next meal? Am I gonna have a shelter over my head? I mean, this is serious stuff. But in the midst of all this, they're learning how to navigate that. They're also learning how to navigate much, much greater things, and that is the freedom that higher education will give them if they can get through this. So at the end of the day with his 400 kids, Tom asked them, what is the most important thing that you learned in this program? One kid said, that climate change exists. Another kid said, how global warming works. Another one said, humans are the biggest cause of global warming. Another one says, we need to change or climate change can be dangerous. Another one says, we've changed the atmosphere in 100 years from its steady trend of 100,000 years. Another one said, 2017 is a little worrisome. Another one summed it up by saying, you need to know about the world to know where you stand in life. These are just a few of the comments. But the power of collaboration gives us a chance to make a difference. So I want to offer hope if we can figure out how to collaborate. And I want to challenge us to collaborate for the hope of our great, 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 great grandchildren. Thank you. You, got this, you guys are our first three panelists. You want to come up and have a seat? Sure. All right. Um, just a, a word about the climate, the climate change communication. Uh, when we were talking about, uh, we've done a couple of programs in the past about the impacts of climate change, especially in the highlands where Friends of Blackwater, which is the organization that I'm a board member of, uh, and that my wife Judy runs, uh, worried about the impacts of climate change in the Allegheny Highlands, uh, losing such things as uh, native brook trout. They're, they're on the chopping block. Current trends, forget it. No more. The, this is the state fish of West Virginia, for goodness sake. Uh, and that's true of so many species in the Highlands, and it's true of so many aspects of our economy uh, here, not to mention the ski industry, things like that. Really, really uh, kind of grim prospects. Uh, for uh, the future if we don't rein in climate change. And then we did one program here, very interesting program uh, a year or two ago, uh, on uh, where we looked at carbon capture and what was being done here at WVU. And a lot of people have been working on that. And then we did another, so we thought we'd do one more conference, uh, those having been kind of nice. And uh, climate communication is something that uh, I, I think that, it, 
is so important. And uh, if you look at what Ann was referring to, it, the, the real some of the real heroes on the climate change front in West Virginia are science teachers. And they're the people who run her HISTA clubs like that, because that's their job is to tell the truth. They can't evo avoid it. They have to tell the scientific truth. And that's challenging in West Virginia for political reasons. Uh, and nevertheless, they very courageously do that job every day. And uh, they've been great uh, sponsors of uh, educational programs so the teachers learn more about the, the science. So c communicating about climate change, it seems to be, every, whenever you look around at the issue, seems to be really a crucial uh, aspect of it. Not just what's the science and uh, what are the technologies that can fix it, but how do, how do you build the social uh, consensus and the cultural and political uh, support for it in a communication fashion. And of course that involves every, and in climate, so many disciplines, and we got uh, two, three disciplines here, or two disciplines and one practical person in this first round, and then the second round we're going to have three uh, science teachers who are going to talk about cl climate communication specifically in that context. The first one is uh, Dylan uh, Selterman, who is a professor of psychology. And obviously, if you're going to communicate with human beings, you have to understand how human beings operate. And uh, he has uh, applied his research in the area of game theory and uh, how people calculate risks and that ilk to the area of climate change. And uh, he wrote a great article in the National Geographic uh, recently uh, uh, that combined that, and he's going to talk about that. The uh, second speaker is Josh. Josh, what's your last name again? Murphy. Murphy, I thought so. I was going to be embarrassed. Uh, he is a graduate student, just about a PhD, going to be a professor at the uh, George Mason University Center for Climate Change Communication, where there are a bunch of people studying all different kinds of and he's going to try to give us an overview of the whole field of uh, climate change communication. The third speaker is Rafe Pomerantz. He uh, was recently featured on the cover of the New York Times Magazine. Did you bring your copy, Rafe? <laughs> Rafe, that doesn't look like you. Show us a... <laughs> Well, if you if you make the if you make the cover story of the New York Times Magazine, you are allowed to promote it a little bit, I think. And uh, but he was one of the people uh, involved in first bringing climate change to the American uh, consciousness, and he's got a nice farm down in Germany Valley, and that's where we got to know Rafe, uh, friendship with his West Virginia connections, uh, Boater. So he's going to give the closing remarks today at the end of the conference. But this morning, uh, one of our speakers wasn't able to come, and so we asked Rafe if he would talk about you know, what he's learned about climate change communication in 40 plus years of doing that kind of work uh, all over the world. He's now the chair of Arctic 21, which is an organization that communicates to the public about the risks of climate change to the Arctic. So we'll start out with Dylan, come on up, and I'll move out of the way. And have a seat. I'll sit down here at the end. And we're, we're gonna, they're gonna go 15 minutes each, and or at the most, and... <laughs> No, no, because really uh, the opportunity to engage with folks from the audience is uh, just as important as what they're going to say in their talk. All right, hi everyone. So I'm from the University of Maryland, and as uh, Tom said, I work in the psychology department, and I'm very excited to be here and talk to you about the psychology of climate change. Um, so my story begins in the summer of 2015, when I was working at my desk, and all of a sudden started getting phone calls and emails from NPR and the Baltimore Sun and Fox News and the Washington Post and BuzzFeed and local radio stations and they were all asking about this extra credit question that I was giving to my class. And I'm not gonna lie, my first thought was, uh-oh, what, what did I do and what did my students do? Because I'm not the type of person who loves all of that attention. Um, so what were they doing? They were tweeting 
This tweet by one of my students was liked and retweeted over 10,000 times in a matter of days. And as I started to you know, talk with more people in the media about this exercise, I got really excited because people were talking about psychology and they were talking about game theory. And I knew that this was a teachable moment. I knew that I had an opportunity to educate people about the tragedy of the commons and about the prisoner's dilemma, and that this was a way to help people conceptualize group decision-making and environmental concerns. People saw this not only as an exercise in social behavior, but morality and ethics as well, that their personal choices could affect the lives of others around them. So let's talk a little bit about the exercise first. And full disclosure, I did not create this exercise. This exercise was being used for decades before I came on the scene. It was invented in the early 90s, and my professor in college, Steve Dragotis, was the one who did it with my class, and that's how I learned about it. But essentially, students are given the opportunity to choose two or six points of extra credit that goes on their term paper grade. Um, so they are free to choose whichever they like, but there is a catch. If more than 10% choose six points, then nobody gets any points. So there is a, an upper limit on the amount of overconsumption of the points in the exercise. So, and, and by the time this got famous, from uh, 2008 to 2015, I had taught dozens of classes over that time, and only one class actually got the points. And that class actually hit 10 right on the nose. They were just on the threshold. And all of the other classes I taught had failed the exercise. They all went over the 10% threshold. Now it's worth noting, and I'll talk about this a little bit in a couple of minutes here, but most students, usually around 80%, choose two points. So the idea that this exercise reveals that we're all selfish, I think is incorrect. Most people are trying to make the communal choice. And then after the exercise, my students and I discuss Garrett Hardin's influential essay on the tragedy of the commons, and about the dilemma we face about our individual growth and well-being versus societal stability. Garrett Hardin's influential essay was written 50 years ago, and he outlined this inherent dilemma we face as we try to maximize our individual benefit while at the same time trying to account for everyone's collective well-being. The points in the exercise are analogous to grazing pasture, as Hardin described, or water, or land, or oil, or any other resource. And if we're thinking inversely about pollution, it's the amount of you know, carbon dioxide or other greenhouse gases that we're emitting. And if a few people are over-consuming, that's not necessarily a problem. But if too many people are thinking this way, and if all we're thinking about is maximizing our own benefits, that could be a big problem. If too many of us consider only what's good for ourselves, then we end up with overconsumption. This is how we end up with over-harvesting, water shortages, or, as we're here to talk about today, climate change. So now the next logical question is, okay, well, how do we, how do we fix this? How do we solve this problem and reduce the amount of overconsumption? And this is where psychology does offer some answers and solutions. As I'm sure many of you are aware, we look up to those that we admire, our role models, our parents, our teachers, celebrities, and positive role models can promote good behavior. We can also reward or punish people. We can give incentives or fine people for overconsumption. This is straight out of behaviorism. California now fines people for using too much water. We can incentivize green behaviors like solar panels or hybrid cars. And of course, don't underestimate the power of social norms. And as I mentioned a couple minutes ago, most people are choosing two points. So this is a normative behavior. And simply the awareness or the activation of social norms can shift people's behavior because we're very, very social and we want to fit in. Research has shown that if you look at people's behavior, let's say whether they reuse their towels in hotel rooms, if you have the standard pro-environmental message, this is good for the planet, that's not going to work nearly as well as saying most of the other people who stay in this hotel reuse their towels. So maybe you'd want to fit in with everybody else. And on your utility bill, if you get your energy usage and right next to it is the mean or the average for your community, if, you're at, if your score is a little bit higher, you're going to bring your consumption down because you want to fit in with the community, the rest of the group. So social norms can be very powerful. 
Now, Garrett Hardin suggested in his essay that educating people about the tragedy of the commons can help solve the problem. And I'm gonna come out with a hot take. I don't think that that's true. I don't think that knowledge is necessarily going to fix the problem because throwing facts in people's faces doesn't necessarily change their minds. It's worth noting that after this exercise got very famous, some of my colleagues told me, oh, that's too bad, you're not gonna be able to use this exercise anymore because now the students will know about it and they'll all get the points. No. <laughs> they continued, I, I used this exercise for another year after it got famous and students continued to fail. They, they did not stay under the 10% threshold even though they knew about the exercise. Now, why is that? Well, again, we have an idea from psychology that is we do lots of motivated reasoning. When our intellect is strengthened, then we use our reasoning capabilities in order to confirm, not change our beliefs. And I wanna bring in some data from Dan Cahan, who's at Yale and studies cultural cognition and has done some research specifically on people's attitudes toward climate change, asking, for example, is there solid evidence of recent global warming due to mostly human activities? And this graph, I think, shows all of what you need to know here. So on the left, you see how ordinary science intelligence or knowledge, the type of thing that you can measure with standardized testing, predicts polarization. So on the left here, you see you know, people with low science knowledge, they're not really sure whether there's evidence for global warming. But then as you move to the right of this graph, liberals and Democrats are very convinced that it's happening, whereas conservative Republicans are saying, no, it's not. So the, 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 the evidence here is that knowledge and intelligence predicts polarization. But what about some other variable that might help us? We do have evidence that curiosity predicts convergence, attitude convergence among liberals and conservatives as a function of curiosity. And this is not something that you can do with standardized testing. This is measured by, say, looking at how much time pe people spend watching documentaries about science or reading science magazines. Their genuine intrinsic interest in the topic is what predicts their attitude convergence on climate change. And the good thing is that curiosity is something that we're born with. We have it from the minute we're entering into this world. So what we need to do is just capitalize on people's natural instincts to explore. So my first take home point for this talk today is don't try to change people's minds. Instead, try to capitalize on their existing values, the things that they genuinely care about, because that's gonna offer a much better solution here. And I wanna segue to talk a little bit about another big theory in psychology that I've been working on for the past few years, and that's moral foundations theory. Moral foundations theory suggests that people have a diversity of moral concerns, among them care, fairness, and liberty, which on average happen to be more prominently held by liberals, and others including loyalty, respect, and purity, which on average happen to be held more prominently by conservatives. Care is about protection from harm. Fairness is about equality. Liberty is about individual freedom. Loyalty is about patriotism and allegiance. Respect is about deference to authority figures and institutions. And purity is about spirituality, the idea your body is a temple, avoiding things that are disgusting or degrading. Moral foundations theory suggests that people can have different moral pathways, but often they might lead to the same conclusions. So think about this you know, from the perspective of liberals. If you're concerned about equality in thinking about the tragedy of the commons, it would be logical to consider what you would want others to do and then act accordingly. Put another way, the golden rule. If you want others to conserve, you should conserve. Conservatives, more concerned maybe about with the strength of our community and our nation. So in thinking about the tragedy of the commons, it would be logical to consider what would be best for society as a whole to keep everything intact. Or put another way, e pluribus unum, and the idea that conservation is patriotic. That is, we're doing what's best for the country. Green is the new red, white, and blue. Case in point would be the Pentagon, usually in charge of the military stuff. They're now considering climate change and national security threats. So building on this, I wanna reference some work by Matt Feinberg and Rob Willer, who studied people's attitudes toward environmental behaviors using stories. And they gave people 
in this experiment, a story, and participants were randomly assigned to be told in the story that the protagonist, the main character, either recycled or did not recycle, or in the control condition, they didn't get any information about recycling. And for conservatives, who are pictured here on the right, these three bars, uh, and when they were asked to rate the morality of this character, it didn't really matter whether the character recycled or not. This was not for them a moral issue. For liberals, it was. When they were told that the character recycled, they liked this person a lot more in terms of you know, the moral rating. And when the person didn't recycle, they rated the character as significantly less moral. Now, this shows that liberals moralize recycling behavior and environmental behaviors more generally. Why might that be? Well, according to um, you know, some other research by these folks, they found that pro-environmental messages are often framed in terms of the moral foundation that liberals care a little bit more about. Messages like help protect the environment and save the environment. This is very harm and care-centered language. So the researchers thought, well, okay, what if we reframe the message to be consistent with something conservatives care more about? So they reframed the message to focus on purity and sanctity. They used messaging like, pollution is gross and disgusting. We need to clean up the planet. And they found that when they used the purity sanctity framing, the difference between liberals and conservatives went away. It vanished completely, statistically speaking. So we have some evidence that moral foundations you know, theory suggests you can have different pathways to the same conclusion, but you have to reach people based on things they already care about. Now I wanna come full circle here and go back to the class exercise the one that went viral. I mentioned how, you know, despite the fame of the exercise, students still weren't getting the points, but I wasn't satisfied with that. I wanted to see whether I could nudge my students to change. I wanted to see if they we, would be willing to sacrifice the, the points for, for their grade that they love so much. So in 2016, I introduced a third option. So in addition to the original two, students can choose either two points, six points, or zero points. Now, why would students choose zero points? Because now, either way, they're not gonna get anything. But for every student who chooses zero, one of the six-point choosers chosen at random will lose all their points. So the six-point chooser chosen at random will have their, all their points taken away, and that person will be subtracted from the total. So by choosing zero, this is uh, taken from Ernest Fair and Simon Gachter's idea of altruistic punishments. And by the way, I don't necessarily love that terminology because there's some debate about whether altruism is really a thing. Uh, but, the, but the behavior is clear. It's a self-sacrificing behavior in order to reduce overconsumption behavior in the context of the group. So since implementing this third option, before I mentioned you know, virtually none of the classes got the points, now about half of them do. So we, we went to about, about one out of every two classes that I teach now gets the points. I'll show you the data from just this past semester. I did this exercise with my fall 2008 social psychology class. 119 students in this section, 104 chose two points, 11 chose six, and four chose zero for an effective rate of 5.83% overconsumption, well below the 10% threshold. So to me, this is a remarkable turnaround. And just this semester, for the first time, I tried another twist on top of the uh, twist I just mentioned, where I invited some students who ended up with positive points to donate one of their points to the zero-point choosers. And three of my students came up after class and said, yeah, I'd like to donate one of my points to those who chose zero. So we seem to be naturally inclined toward more pro-social behavior when this extra element is introduced, and we like rewarding those who sacrifice for the benefit of the collective. So in conclusion, my second take home point is that of action by a few people can make a significant difference. A few students can help an entire class of hundreds gain a leg up in the course. A few people who recycle or compost can have a contagious effect on others' lifestyles. A few politicians' votes can alter national and international policies that affect millions and billions. I'm excited and inspired to see Congress this week introduce the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, which I know some others in this group are gonna talk about. I know Jim's gonna talk about it from CCL later today. Um, and this was, this was introduced by a bipartisan group of Democrats and Republicans. If passed, it would reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 40% in 10 years and 90% by 2050. 
That's a bigger cut than even President Obama's clean power plan or the United States' commitment under the Paris Climate Agreement. So we can make change and keep some healthy optimism. And remember these wise words from the Beatles, all the world is birthday cake, so take a piece, but not too much. Thank you. Hey everyone, good morning. Uh, my name is Josh Murphy. I'm, uh, you know, as, as our uh, host said earlier today, I'm a, a ABD PhD candidate at George Mason University. Um, and I work studying uh, broadcasters, climate journalists, um, and regular journalists who are interested in climate change uh, through my work at 4C. And uh, kind of how I came to this topic, I, I worked as a radio broadcaster for a couple of years before I got into um, kind of the academic pursuit, and um, I never really lost kind of that respect slash kind of itch to be in the media. Uh, <laughs> and so I, I, I really um, enjoy kind of the work that we're doing. So today what I'm going to do, give you guys uh, an overview of the Center for Climate Change Communication, what we've been doing for the past 11 years that we've been open. I'm going to talk about the uh, Climate Matters in the Newsroom Project, um, and then I'm also going to, uh, if we have time, briefly touch on some of the work that I'm specifically doing uh, with barriers to climate journalism. Um, so let's see here. Uh, when uh, just to kind of get in with our mission statement, um, our, our mission at 4C, Center for Climate Change Development, is the acronym. Uh, <laughs> our mission is to develop and apply social science insights to help society make informed decisions that'll stabilize Earth's climate and prevent further harm uh, that's due to climate change. In order to achieve this goal, uh, we engage in three different broad activities at our center. Of uh, the one, we conduct unbiased communication research around climate change topics. Uh, two, we help government agencies, civic organizations, professional associations, and uh, other companies apply social science research in order to improve uh, public engagement initiatives. And then the, our third uh, kind of thing that we do is that we train students and professionals with the knowledge and skills necessary to improve public engagement on climate change. Um, so I'm going to briefly go over some of our programs. Uh, the first program that we that we launched, um, kind of the second year that we were open, was Climate Change in the American Mind. Um, some people may have heard of it. I talked to some people last night at the dinner about it. Um, and it was one of our earliest programs established at the center. It was in a partnership with the Yale Project on Climate Change Communication, uh, where we conduct nat uh, nationally representative surveys twice a year in most years in order to explore and track a generalized public understanding of climate change. And then we can compare those surveys kind of year in and year out. Um, Another uh, project that we do is a Climate Matters, uh, and it's, a, it's basically where we take a TV weathercasters and try to teach them how to be climate educators. Uh, so that launched in 2009. Um, another one is Climate and Health. Uh, and Climate and Health, uh, it's a collaboration. Uh, we launched that in 2014, and it's a collaboration um, with leading medical and nursing societies and other organizations. And we essentially assess clinicians' knowledge of and experiences with uh, climate change and health and how uh, climate change can impact health. And um, we also try to use the, uh, that data to educate the public and policymakers about ongoing and negative effects of climate change, as well as some of the health benefits for solving the issue. Um, more of our programs that we work with, sorry, let me, there we go. Um, Republican, uh, that launched in 2012 under the leadership of a six-term Republican congressman from South Carolina, I believe it was the fourth district, uh, Bob Ingalls. Um, it started as, it was known as the Energy and Enterprise uh, Initiative, but it later became known as Republican. Um, and it's been working to bring political conservatives back into the conversation about climate change by facilitating climate change dialogues that are centered around free market. Uh, I think that's a really interesting project. I haven't worked too much with that one, but I've met a lot of people with it, and it's a really cool program. I think you should check it out. Um, and uh, since uh, 2012, we've also been working in a partnership with the National Park Service um, uh, and the Urban Ecology Research Alliance, where we've been hosting climate change uh, communications uh, internships. And we've placed over two dozen interns, I believe, in the national parks, and th they work uh, closely along park staff in order to develop educational resources for um, students and, and programs that, that teach about the impacts of climate change. And um, finally, uh, climate resilience in the mid-Atlantic. Um, 
since 2012, uh, when we launched that, we've been in partnership with a myriad of uh, government agencies, civic organizations, and universities throughout the Northern Virginia, D.C. region. Um, and we conduct and provide communication research and resources to, uh, to all those organizations so that we can strengthen their own programs that exist um, about addressing climate issues. So um, briefly, I'm going to talk about some of our latest reports that have come out this year. Um, so the... Uh, the first one is, uh, do millennials see climate change as more than just a meme? Uh, and the paper uh, compares the climate change public opinions of millennials, uh, people born between 1981 and 2000, to those of older generations. And, uh, and kind of what we found through this report was that millennials have similar or even less engagement on global warming than other generations. And millennials are less likely to discuss global warming with their friends and families compared to, to older Americans. Um, and they're also ju just as likely to believe that global warming is happening, and they're also just as likely to believe that it's personally important to them. They're just not having these same conversations for whatever reason. Um, whoops. Uh, so another report that came out was politics and global warming. Um, and in that, we found that a majority of registered voters, 63%, uh, are actually worried about global warming. And this includes 88% of liberal Democrats, 76% uh, of moderate conservative de Democrats, 58% of moderate Republicans and about 30% of conservative Republicans. And um, th now, now, and that has jumped to the, the moderate Republicans. It, it jumped 15% in the last year. So we thought that was kind of encouraging. Um, and I'm going to talk about some of these ones a little bit later because they're part of some of the work that I've done. But uh, we, we've also surveyed four different professional journalism societies in the last year, uh, the Society of Environmental Journalists, the Radio, Television, Digital News Association, the... Uh, so, uh, the um, National Association of Black Journalists and the National Association of Hispanic Journalists. Um, we've also published a new uh, Climate Change in the American Mind survey this year, um, and we also published a report about the March of Science that occurred last year where we interviewed several of the people that were in the march and then people that uh, were following it and sharing it and supporting it using uh, digital social media platforms. So now um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my work uh, with the Climate Matters in the Newsroom Project. So uh, I've been a part of the Climate Matters in the Newsroom team uh, since I was first hired to work at the center about five semesters ago. And uh, with this specific project, um, it's an expansion of the uh, standard Climate Matters program. But the Climate Matters program was just meant for weathercasters and to help meteorologists become climate educator, uh, educators. And that program, we had a lot of success with that. I believe we have over 500 uh, weathercasters nationwide that are currently receiving our materials. But we wanted to broaden those trainings and those materials to not only apply to weathercasters, but to apply to any journalists from a wide variety of beats, backgrounds, mediums, kind of things like that. Um, so uh, we wanted to essentially help these journalists be able to tell timely, science-based stories um, and, and kind of treat climate change as a local issue because a lot of what we found in our work is that people tend to care about the material more when it's presented as a local issue. Um, so let's see. And uh, data was collected. It is kind of warm in here, but I don't want to... Uh, oh, uh, several people are saying it's a little hot in this room. I don't know if we can. The climate's warming. <laughs> it's changing since we've all came in here. We need to do something about it. Yeah, 88% think it's bad. 57% think it's kind of bad. 30% aren't laughing. So it looks like we have somebody on that. So I'll go ahead and uh, keep going just for the sake of time. Uh, so we used uh, three different uh, data collect. I'm assuming somebody's on it. Somebody's looking at somebody's it. Looking at it. Great. Yeah. So we used three different data collection methods, uh, and, and we partnered with uh, multiple professional journalism societies, like I said before. Uh, we conducted uh, interviews in uh, the fall of 2017 with roughly 50 journalists to get an idea, kind of, to, to kind of have them tell their story, what the barriers they're running into, challenges they face, kind of the, 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 the resources they wanted. And we used that to design a survey. Um, and, the, uh, and the survey went to just under 2,000 uh, journalists uh, completed the entire thing. And we found out a lot of really interesting things about them. We found out um, a lot about the members' views about the role of a journalist uh, in, in climate change and their impacts. Uh, we learned about journalists' overall understanding of climate change um, and which journalists had a really strong understanding, which ones didn't, and kind of what informed that. Um, we learned what their individual kind of perspectives and experiences are with climate change reporting, learned about the obstacles to reporting on climate change, and um, their practices of whether or not they present opposite viewpoints as kind of a journalistic norm. So um, 
I'm going to talk a little bit about our partner societies before I get into uh, kind of what they responded with. So the first society uh, was the Society of Environmental Journalists. These are largely uh, freelance journalists. I think about a third or two thirds of them worked as freelancers at the time of the survey. And uh, these are these are people who essentially uh, find their own leads. They write their own their own stuff. They they they'll either uh, kind of contract out through a um, through a uh, major kind of broadcasting uh, entity, or they'll just self publish. Um, but they, they're the ones that typically have the most training, and they're already coming from some sort of environmental science background. And we noticed that they had very um, interesting and kind of unique perspectives on this. We also had the National Association of Black Journalists. Um, like I said earlier, the National Association of Hispanic Journalists and RTDNA. Um, RTDNA, or the Radio, Television, Digital News Association, that's an association mainly of uh, news managers, news directors, kind of people that are behind the scenes and aren't necessarily engaging with stories day in and day out. And it was very interesting to see how much of a different kind of take that they had on a lot of these issues and how they perceived a lot of the uh, problems differently than the journalists who kind of were the boots on the ground. Um, so before I get into what they said to, I want to cover one last thing. Um, we did have we, we we broke our participants down into six different uh, groups, essentially based on what their role was in the media. So the managers, um, you know, they have a heavy influence on the overall culture of the workplace. They decide kind of the broad level direction. Uh, they handle hiring. They they sometimes will handle promotions, where the funding goes, what stories will be covered, what ones won't be covered on a broad level. And kind of extension of managers or news directors, you can think of them as like the manager that's actually in the newsroom. They're the, they're the ones that are ensuring that the will of the general managers and broader managers are being carried out. Um, we also have general reporters. Uh, th that, those are the people you kind of think of when you uh, when you think of journalists. They're the ones who are going to be behind the desk, behind the microphone, in front of the camera. Um, they're typically writing um, some, some of the media content that's delivered. And these general reporters, the big difference between them and a beat reporter is that the, uh, the, the general reporter kind of covers whatever goes in front of them. Beat reporters are very sp uh, specified. They, they, they have maybe one to three or four things that they typically write about, and they tend to have deeper understanding of their topic. And we found that a lot of people that do climate change consider themselves kind of the, in the beat reporter mold because they spend so much time at such a, um, as there, you know, there's, there's so much kind of prerequisite knowledge for covering it in an accurate way. Um, we also have producers. So uh, producers, they create the programming. Uh, and what I mean by that is they kind of handle the graphics, the, the mics, the setup, the uh, posting of the show. They, they're, they're sometimes uh, considered kind of the people that um, don't necessarily give you the news, but they're responsible for the for the kind of the vehicle in which it's delivered. And then finally, like I said earlier, a little bit freelancers. Uh, they can be made up of anybody, but generally they're beat reporters who are no longer with their networks, either because of downsizing or they decided to, to leave on their own. And um, they use, generally use a whole wide variety of mediums to get to that audience. So now, um, with all of that kind of out of the way, I want to get into some of our findings. Um, so the, the first fi uh, group of findings we'll talk about are, the, are some of their interests and obstacles. And this isn't every finding from the report. Uh, if you want the reports, like I think each one is over 80 pages, so I'm not going to do that. So if you, but if you guys were curious, I can absolutely send it to you. But I'm going to um, first point: over a third of journalists in our sample wor have worked within climate change in the past year, which is pretty huge considering that these aren't necessarily climate journalists; these are just people that that are that are covering it. And uh, so, uh, w with that, over um, four out of ten participants said that they had supervised or covered the story within the last 12 months. Um, nearly all journalists in the sample were interested in covering it, even the ones that hadn't covered it. In fact, nine out of 10 journalists that were in our sample, 2,000 person sample, said that they're at least slightly interested um, in reporting on climate change solutions, and four out of 10 said they're very interested. And a lot of times, if they were interested but not doing it, it's because they don't feel like they have the skill set or the access or, and whatnot, and I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, yeah, like, so like I said, uh, eight out of 10 uh, participants, uh, they identified that lack of training in climate science. So the fact that they didn't really know how to engage with the material properly is their obstacle for reporting on it, maybe why they didn't. And then uh, also more than half identified lack of time if, um, you know, for field reporting, lack of time and space in the news outlet, and then lack of uh, consistent role models for climate change. I'm talking with my hands too much. Um, uh, next, kind of looking at the audience and society, very few journalists, contrary to popular belief, actually expected to receive a negative reaction from their audience when they recovered climate change, because kind of, you know, some of the, what we thought kind of stereotypically going into the project was, oh, they may not be covering it because they're scared of, you know, divisiveness or whatever, but that really wasn't the case. Only one in 10 of survey participants uh, expected to receive, um, or did receive, mostly or entirely negative feedback from the audience when they, when they um, posted it, and kind of, in fact, Many journalists even believe that covering climate change would be a smart career move. Six out of 10 in our surveys um, 
thought that reporting on climate change would be beneficial to them. And whether that's because it's a new skill set or it's an emerging issue, you know, there are a lot of kind of theories behind that, but 60% over that. And then um, it, more importantly, I think most importantly, over nine out of 10 journalists in our sample believe that reporting on climate change was actually beneficial for society. And more than seven out of 10 say it's very beneficial. So they don't think it's, so essentially from this slide, they don't think it's gonna really be negative that they cover it. They think it'd be good for them to cover it and they think it's good for society. And, and so now kind of moving on, most journalists actually believe the global warming is happening on top of that. Over 90% of survey participants think that it's happening and eight, ten, or excuse me, and eight out of 10 believe that they're either sure or extremely sure. Um, and on top of that, most journalists in the sample believe that global warming is harmful. Again, very similar numbers. Nine out of 10 believe that they'll be personally harmed by global warming, and eight out of 10 believe that they'll be harmed either a moderate amount or great. And harm, not just like physical harm, but you know, health, so social harm, economic harm, kind of broader terms with that. And then finally, we have all this in mind, yet we see that there are still some journalistic norms that are getting in the way of, of climate change coverage. So despite the fact that most participants are being convinced that human-caused climate change is occurring and harmful, many said that reporting, uh, or they, they, many said that they report two sides of a climate story and it was helpful for, more, you know, for one or more reasons. Um, you know, so we, we typically will call this false balance where even though the science is settled about an issue, journalists feel they're, it's their duty to be objective. I keep hitting that, I'm gonna move that over there. Uh, they feel like it's their duty to be objective. And so as a result, they treat climate change as if it's less subtle than it is for the sake of the, uh, kind of pushing the journalistic norm forward. So six out of 10 journalists say that reporting both sides of the story, both sides, will enable them to acknowledge different viewpoints exist, okay? Uh, will, will it help them avoid the appearance of bias? And they say it's essential to objective, balanced journalism, and it'll help maintain their credibility. Um, and also, some journalists report that they're not sure how settled the science actually is. Nearly half of journalists on um, the sample feel that presenting two sides of the climate story is important because the science of climate change is, quote unquote, still being debated. So um, moving on from that, I'm going to talk about a little bit about my current research um, with that. So within this big data set, different members of the team, we all kind of look at a different problem that the journalists face. And, and the one that me and my co-authors are interested in the most are the barriers to climate journalism. Because the, those barriers, if we can figure out a way to reducing those, my theory is that it'll increase climate reporting, it'll increase, increase accurate climate reporting, and since the journalists are really the gatekeepers for a lot of climate information for the general public, I think by accessory, the general public will begin to have a more informed opinion on it too. So we've uncovered um, two pretty important um, findings uh, through, through our work so far. We found that barriers are dynamically linked, and it basically means that all those barriers I, I kind of listed before, um, and, I'll, and I'll show them again on the next slide, uh, they don't exist in isolation, where, where if someone is having an issue you know, with lack of climate training being an issue, they're probably also gonna have an issue finding local sources, because they, you know, they don't know necessarily how to find a good source, and they, or they, they might, for example, feel that their audience isn't gonna have a great reaction because they don't know how to write for that audience in whatever their market is. And so we've been able to prove with the exploratory factor analysis that the barriers in the survey are related. Um, and we also have been able to determine that treating all journalists like they're the same and giving them well, one size fits all training for, for climate reporting doesn't work because different journalists in different positions within the media perceive barriers differently than one another. So. Oh, I'm sorry. So, yeah, okay. um, I'm, I'm trying to you know, squeeze Ray's in, and I can see which audience wants to ask some questions. Sure, sure. So, um, I will fa I will fast forward through all this. Then, uh, here's how our journalists responded to all the barriers, um, dynamically linked barriers. We found that it, it, rather than having this huge list before, it makes more sense to just say there are three: access, support, and time. Um, Here's how, and it's kind of hard to see on the slide, but here's how uh, different positions within the media perceive the different issues. And we, we did find that there is a wide variety of uh, perspectives on different issues. For example, managers don't think managers are the problem. Uh, kind of funny. Um, people that work more closely with the stories actually uh, feel more efficacious covering them. And uh, that's pretty interesting because that tells us, okay, well, sometimes just doing it can, can be enough to, to, to build those skills. Um, and some of the future directions uh, that, that we're, that we're gonna be going in uh, with the research, we're gonna try to determine the different needs of journalists, work on specific tailored trainings in different situations. Um, we're also gonna try to reduce false balance reporting on climate issues. And uh, we're gonna try to create um, and facilitate easier tools, maybe social media integrated, text, things like that, that will allow journalists to, uh, to access information in a quicker, more effective way. And I will be happy to take your questions later, because I'm out of time. <laughs> Coming soon to a university. <laughs>
<laughs> oh, I'm gonna. Need to be. I just went racing to take the stand, but I just want to say, I just yesterday got an email from the place where Josh worked oh. saying that uh, they're recruiting PhD students. Yes. Uh, yes, and uh, they've got a remarkable program, and there's the young woman who was here at WVU. It, what's the woman who? Oh, Lindsay. Yeah, Lindsay. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah she was going to speak here, but she couldn't come, and she got Josh to come. Uh, but it's uh, it's really a, a source of national national scholarship, mm -hmm. but also providing the generation of teachers and researchers who are going to be in universities all around America talking about climate change. This issue obviously is not going anywhere, and one of the great facets that we're trying to illuminate today is the folks who are working on it in the academy under the disciplines of all these different historic disciplines, psychology, communications. What is your actual Thank you, Tom. First, I'll try to achieve some solidarity with the audience by taking off my jacket <laughs> and cool off. Uh, so, yes, Tom, uh, and to say thank you to Tom and, and to Judy, who have been great friends for decades. And we have worked, we've sat in many restaurants in Davis and Thomas talking about climate change over the years and many other regional conservation issues. Uh, I'm, I'll be quick. I have another bite at the apple at the end, so that's a good thing. So you don't have to hear it. I only have so many things I can say. So first, self-promotion. But this actually is a major communications moment. Uh, anybody ever see this, the magazine itself? No? August 4th? You're kidding. This was the whole issue of the New York Times Magazine called uh, losing, losing the Planet. And um, the whole issue, I'll say that again. And when you open it up, when you open it up, the first photo, you might not recognize this guy, see? <laughs> Take it in, that's me. I became famous, in case you didn't know. Who? Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Uh, it was an amazing moment. I worked with the author or, or say, for about a year and a half, and it's coming out, this article, which you can find online, is coming out as a book in April, which is the 40th anniversary of, uh, at the moment, the 40 years ago, I started my work uh, where this article begins. And uh, I guess I'm a, uh, uh, but I think just to interpret this as a communications moment, I actually think journalism in this country has made a huge shift on climate change. And it might be because the New York Times decided to tell everybody, this is really important. You know, we're going to devote the whole issue of the magazine to this question. And it's, it's quite incredible, I think, you know, both the, the, the um, Times and Washington Post that have their own sort of climate change teams Pretty impressive, the change that's gone on. Let me make uh, comments on two recent events. Here, here's a communication strategy. When the other guys make the mistake, this is the story. So what happened? Was it last week? What went on? Was it, wouldn't we have a holiday? <laughs> Anybody know? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. And what's the day after called? Excellent. And what was the climate moment on Black Friday? Anybody know? Yes, all the, you all had the right answer. The National Climate Assessment was released that afternoon. Black Friday, 2 o'clock. The worst, the worst time for a report to come out. Nobody reads the papers. Nobody pays any attention, right? So the slick people in the White House are... Uh, figured out this is when we'll release the report, nobody will pay any attention, and we will have sunk four years of a thousand scientists' work deep into the Potomac River. So what happened? It backfired. Everybody figured out they were trying to ba uh, uh, bury this thing, and they decided to play it up, and they made the front pages 
all over the country. The New York Times put it on the top of the fold. Now, it's not easy getting the top of the fold with a climate report, okay? It happens. <laughs> but why did they do that? What do you think their message was? Uh, it was a message to the White House. I think, screw you. We're going to just put this thing way up here because you tried to dump this in the Potomac. We're not going to let you get away with that. And Washington Post did the same thing. I'm convinced it was sort of a vengeful act. I would never say something. Wait, I'm on the record here. <laughs> Scratch that. Scratch that. Media is one of our great, uh, is the free press is a critical ally for all of us all the time. Uh, so that's Black Friday, second event of actually yesterday that's a way to kind of think of the early days of this and how it happened was the death of uh, President Bush. Now, many of you may not know of the role that George H.W. Bush played as a candidate and as a president. But when he was attacking Michael Dukakis, you may remember the governor of Massachusetts, uh, his major attack, this is another form of communications, occurred in a speech in Bo at Boston Harbor. Because Boston Harbor was a mess. And Bush took advantage of this to attack the liberal Democrat on the environment and his speech at Boston Harbor. Now, you don't hear anything about this and all these you know, commentaries on the life of President Bush. But that speech was a big deal in his winning campaign and hugely important on the environment. You may remember the phrase, those who are worried about the greenhouse effect are ignoring the White House effect. It's a pretty good one-liner, even for a presidential candidate, right? I don't usually talk about Republicans this way, but this, this Bush saw the strategic opening and, and his campaign, and they, the issue of climate change had become big enough by that point. They made that pledge, and the biggest outcome from that pledge was the negotiation of the Framework Convention on Climate Change, which was achieved in Rio in 1992. And that sentence, that sentence that Bush offered, uh, we never let them forget it. We got that into editorials in the New York Times everywhere as the administration. Whenever they would fall back, we would push that sentence back out there. So uh, uh, it's worth remembering that that was 30 to 40 years ago all that happened, that the issue was understood, the science was understood. The first meeting of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change occurred the day after Bush was elected, uh, was in Geneva. So we've been going at it for a long time. Let me just briefly touch on some of the issues in communication that I see as a practitioner. I'm an advocate, I'm a policy person. Uh, I've been involved in, with scientists, with the media. I was a, in the State Department for six years as a US negotiator. I've been an organizer on this. So come, I come at it from a lot of different episodes. Um, the first is an underlying, why is everybody working so hard to try to figure out how you communicate climate change? Well, one reason is that we have been, this, we have been the victims of a massive propaganda campaign. That sounds really, that's not what I normally say. But what ExxonMobil did, they had scientists who understood this issue and its gravity. And they, their PR people reversed their strategy. Instead of saying, this is really serious, we've got to take it, they funded all kinds of front groups and um, made you know, ad campaigns that essentially said that this doesn't exist. This is all about uncertainty. We don't really know anything when we know a lot. And my perception is that what is embedded in the US population, and when you see this, these conservative Republicans, you have to remember that there was an organized campaign to undermine what was well understood in the scientific community. And we suffer that legacy in this country now because we don't have the political will to act. The world can't move without us, really. And you can't get anything. You say, well, there's six people on a carbon tax bill. You know, that's great. That's, and it's bipartisan. That's great. 
But at the end of the last Congress, Scalise, the leader from Louisiana, the state that is going under, offered a resolution in opposition to a carbon tax because the Koch brothers said, time for you to do this. Let's get everybody on the record so we can use it against them. Didn't work. The Democrats took the House. So I don't, leaving aside the sort of politics and how you feel about it, this is a factor. Denialism is not an accident. And that problem is with us. It's serious. And how do you overcome that? I have only, I think, bringing the theoretical analysis to all the people who do, people do media on this is a really good idea. I'm sitting here thinking, I'm really resistant to these guys. They have good analysis, and I don't listen to them. I just do what I want. <laughs> I do this the way I want. But I think we could, people who do this day to day actually could use some help in kind of framing this. So uh, I offer my uh, uh, wish that that could happen. Uh, next is collaboration. collaboration, even with people who know more than you do about something. <laughs> when you're feeling really defensive, right? And you don't want to learn anymore. Collaborate. OK. Uh, next question, impacts. Now, here's the secret politically, impacts. I said Tom talked about the impacts, and you listen to Tom, he knows every impact in the Allegheny Mountains in this region and how you lay that out for people so they know what's coming. Well, my view of impacts is what I call climate impact strategy. The way to win is to create the political platform locally on the basis of impacts that you can attribute to climate change that are well understood. And let me explain how that wins the next presidential election just to get your attention, OK? I'll let it go quiet for a minute here. Then uh, <laughs> the uh, Florida. What happens to Florida with climate change? Yes, yes. It is existentially threatened by sea level rise. Most, much of Florida lays on limestone. We know about limestone. It's porous. You can't build a seawall around it. So. This election, there were three statewide races that came down to a fraction of a percent. Tragically, Bill Nelson lost. He was very good on this. But if, if four, eight and a half million people voted, if a small fraction of Florida Republicans and independents shift, the Republican Party has to have Florida to win a presidential election. They have to have it. And once this issue is well enough understood, the theory goes, you guys should critique it, the politics shift. And that has begun to happen. There are many great Republican electeds in local, local electeds in Florida are moving on this because they are experiencing sea level rise now. Now. And there are a host of other impacts in Florida that are very serious. So that's the climate impact strategy. It's a communication strategy. We just did, a, I have partners down there, we did a press event, a, tele, a press uh, conference this week on the National Climate Assessment. We had 40 people on the phone. This was a Florida-based event. Probably two-thirds of them were reporters. There was a lot of coverage of the National Climate Assessment in Florida because the media there has finally begun to understand that this is an existential threat. And three papers in South Florida, the Sun Sentinel, Miami Herald, Palm Beach Post have formed a collaborative uh, called the Invading Seas. And their opening line is that this is the number one issue for Florida in the 21st century. So that's a big change. Uh, OK, how do we bring one, two more, I'll, I'll just offer two more air issues. Um, themes, one is how do we bring how do we bring a bipartisan effort together? We have to have a bipartisan effort to get this done. You can't do it on a partisan basis. The Democrats, when they chose to do, I was part of it, the BTU tax in 93, uh, the Markey Waxman bill later on. If you do energy pricing, carbon tax, without Republicans, what they'll do is they'll just come back and hammer you in the election. They have to be part of it. Well, now we have. For example, we have a $900 billion deficit. $900 billion. Where's the revenue going to come from to help close that gap? 
It's either value added tax, sales tax, or carbon tax, or raising back up the corporate income tax, something like that. So there's a driver there beyond climate, but it has to be bipartisan. What's the word? The word that can capture that is innovation. Because your, your list there, if you ask the Republicans, they love innovation. Democrats like innovation too. R&D uh, policies to stimulate innovation. So I think that innovation is a winning communications concept. Everybody knows we have to innovate to win, economically and environmentally. And both parties like that word. And what does it mean? First policy is that we should expand what's known as ARPA-E. Many of you may not know that's a high-risk R&D agency in DO. Oh, applause. We get money here from them? <laughs> yes. You're an investor. You have a project? You do. Excellent. <laughs> this, is, this is designed to put uh, uh, dollars behind high-risk R&D that can lower the cost of transition of climate. So uh, we need to raise the budget of that to the equivalent of what the Pentagon's version uh, is a DARPA, which is five to six billion a year. We're only spending about 250 or 300 million on this. All we're talking about is the fate of the planet. So final point, how do you get greater ambition and urgency in the system? A part of it is this impacts in Florida. Part of it is pointing to the Arctic, curiously. Because the, I'll talk more about this later, but the Arctic is unraveling. It is unraveling. Sea ice, which is the reflectivity of the planet. Permafrost is thawing. It has double the carbon content of the atmosphere as it thaws. You get a big positive feedback. And finally, the fate of Greenland is the fate of Miami and every other coastal city in the world because Greenland has ultimately seven meters of sea level loss, and it's shrinking. It's not going to produce those that much, that, that kind of number that fast, but it is accelerating now. And the point of the Arctic story is to create greater ambition and urgency in the global negotiations. So I'll talk more about that later. Thank you. <laughs> and we have later cohorts, over 350. Anybody? Anybody? Yeah, I see you. I see that. So the later cohorts. You've been going faster, I noticed. But anyhow, <laughs> let's get your uh, questions. So just raise your hand. I'll call on you. Um, and then you can direct it to whoever the speaker is. You guys don't have to go up to the podium if you, if you don't want to. These microphones, I sure. think, are working. Jamie? Hello. Okay. What are your thoughts about engaging pro-coal West Virginians uh, about climate? Oh, sure. Uh, thanks for a softball. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I mean, I thought maybe this would come up a little later, but right off the bat. Uh, well, I, th I think pro-call West Virginians, uh, well, first of all is to acknowledge the huge role that West Virginia has played in providing energy to this country. That's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is to say we have a big problem with carbon dioxide, and coal is a big part of that. And at some point, for the future of coal is dependent on technologies that can capture the carbon and sequester it. Otherwise, the future of coal is even more problematic. So if uh, I would advise getting behind massive R&D to find a new, to, to find cost uh, efficient m m technologies for coal use that don't produce carbon. And uh, I think that the, the critique of coal is building, and it poses a risk for the West Virginia economy not to get out in front of that and say, look, we can't rely on the fact that the whole world is going to let us burn coal in light of the consequences of climate change. So we better get out in front and, 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 and develop, and believe me, there's plenty of federal money to do this, if there was a deal, to, to provide an alternative future, which includes carbon capture and se carbon sequestration, but recognize that there's a transition underway that it's better to be part of than not. Can I say something here? Wait, just a sec. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Let's, let's not debate. Let's just get some questions and get some responses. I mean, really, if we got into a debate, where are we going to go? Let's try questions and responses, see where we do. Emily? Yeah, so uh, I just want to thank you all for coming and sharing this. It's a really big gallery presentation. You all are witty and great to meet here. And I am curious why I can't find you all on Twitter, because I think you do amazing on Twitter. Uh, we've all talked about how to engage younger people on climate change, and 40% Um, we we did collect the data on the journalists as part of the demographic um, information, but we did not run an analysis based on gender of anything. Um, we we do um, you know for at least for that that particular issue, um, but we did find that I believe only uh, one in ten was expecting backlash, um, and I think our sample I want to say our sample was like fifty four percent female I think. So so ju just doing the math. I, I, I think it's something like that. I, you know, don't quote me on that, but it's, I think it's around there. Um, and, and so I think that, that the reason we haven't run that test yet is because such a small piece of our sample reported having that problem compared to other problems. It is on the list, though. We, we, we are going to make meaningful comparisons like that at some point. Yes. You Thank guys, you. You guys want to say anything about Twitter? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just add on to that real quick. So yeah. I think that's absolutely correct, and even better than Twitter's Instagram. So I, I actually started the Instagram page for the CCL DC. I, I don't know. Is it on? I don't know. It's just not very loud. All right. Is, is this better? Yeah. Yes? Okay. So um, I work with the Citizens Climate Lobby DC chapter, and I actually started the Instagram page for that chapter. So I'm... I'm uh, Citizens Climate Lobby DC is the handle. Um, but there, there's, there's a, a Citizens Climate Lobby overall Instagram page, and I encourage you all to follow that. Thanks. Uh, you know, I, I should be tweeting. I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ken. Oh, hi. It's a two-parter, so I'll get it out as quickly as I can. First part on the psychology and the president of the United States using the word think. What would be your psychology for changing his mind? And the second part is for, for, for not changing his mind, but at least softening his
budgets or what, whatever you would call it to reduce their carbon emissions, um, that they now accept the finding of climate change? Yeah. And is this a factor of that they're now natural, they're, they're also exploring for natural gas, which is replacing coal? Or is this um, uh, an epiphany that they have just come to? Or um, is it a marketing approach or, 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 or whatnot? But then the other part of that is, if they're there, why fight about where they've been? And I'll let you guys decide to answer that question. Well, you get fixed. <laughs> <laughs> th th thanks for the softball there. That's a, no, um, okay, so on the one hand, you could probably make a good argument that Trump is just a, a psychological anomaly, and there might not be a way to change his mind specifically, but I think that if, if you could show him the investment value in green energy, that he'd get behind it. Um, I, I think that he cares more about that than, and I'm, what I'm talking about is personally him making money is more important than any policy or any ideological belief. So, yeah, that's, sure. If, if, it, if, it, if it increases his bottom line, I think he'll go for it. I, I, I just will add my part B to that. I offered you an answer that sea level rise will decide the next presidential election. So if you don't get on board, you're gonna lose. Mm. Now, you've heard wishful thinking before. Uh, that might be a form of it, but it's not altogether without, because there are a lot of studies going on in property values in Florida now, and you know, the rate of sales and stuff, people are waking up, including insurance companies and mortgage companies. On the oil industry, you know, the oil industry seeded denialism. They sponsored it, they financed it, and now they're stuck because they can't eliminate it unless they were to spend an enormous amount in, and talk to our friends here, in advertising, social media, Twitter. Can you imagine? Exxon Mobil tweets, this is serious, we gotta deal with this, we're going out of business. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm trying some new lines here. But the, the, <laughs> the uh, so I think, that, uh, why, it, here's the reason. Exxon Mobil put up a million dollars, they support a carbon tax. Nobody can find them supporting a carbon tax. They say it. Where are they? they you know, there was a, uh, a referendum in Washington State on a carbon tax this year. So who put up $35 million in opposition? The oil industry. Mostly BP. Maybe they have refineries there or something. So it's very curious. We don't really, I don't really know where they are. We probably have different people in different places. But could you imagine if they got their act together and put their shoulders to the wheel to get the right marketplace price uh, and decided we really have to solve this for, Ann said, for several generations. This is a multi-generational problem. Let me get another question, Sorry. right? Sorry. No, that's that right. too good. Trump, yeah, you, you know. <laughs> up, let me see. You get somebody from the... Okay, what's your cohort? I have to make sure every cohort is represented. What's your P PPM? Uh, yeah. Uh, 326. 326, okay. We're, you're, you're allowed. Your cohort <laughs> needs to be represented. <laughs> I just want to say something. By the way, we're going to have uh, a number of speakers this afternoon talking about uh, natural gas and the carbon consequences of natural gas. And there's another industry that we we're going to say, you know, was coming along in a pro, maybe a positive direction until uh, the most the presidential election, and now it's kind of where are they? But we're you know one can still hope. Let's well, so we we'll talk about the, that this afternoon a little bit. Go ahead. Uh, yes, my question is to uh, Mr. Murphy. Oh. Uh, the concept of using climate, uh, I'm sorry, webcasters uh, or weather forecasters as mm -hmm. climate educators. Sure. That, that is an excellent question. Um, so, and it actually ties into the question that uh, the earlier that, that another another uh, audience member brought up. But um, a lot of weathercasters, they're no longer just broadcasting on television, but a lot of times they're blogging. They are on social media, whether that's personally or for whatever station they're on. And um, and we find that that 
while not necessarily all Americans are going to be getting, you know, their news necessarily from the weathercasters, we still know that, that a lot of social science theories told us that opinion formation comes from largely from peer groups. So all it takes is a few people on someone's personal network to be engaging with news and then internalizing, okay, this climate change is, is happening. They get a couple facts. They, they, they start to engage with the issue. And then when it comes up in, you know, just private conversation, workplace, whatever, they've kind of started to work towards having that pro-climate belief. So really, that ed the, the, the edu while the climate uh, weathercasters are doing the educating, the real educators, I feel like, are the audience members that take away something from it. So, um, so it's kind of a two-part um, kind of system of having them do it. And, and another reason, too, that we've, we've, uh, no, we've kind of expanded the program to the Climate Matters in the newsroom for all positions is also to kind of um, address what, you're, what you were speaking about, that, that not all, uh, not, not everyone watches the weather anymore, you know, or watches, the, you know, the weathercast. And so by incorporating journalists that aren't only covering weather, but are also writing about regular environment topics or maybe writing about politics or, or, or real estate or anything like that, the, you know, teaching them how to weave in climate um, when they choose to, I feel like also increases kind of the net that we're able to grab people with. If that makes sense. That's, okay, that's all. Let's give these guys a fabulous hand. They did great. All right. Emily, could you stand up for just a second so I can recognize you so people will get it? Emily Calandrelli is our lunchtime keynote speaker, and uh, she asked a question, so I want, want you all to see her. She's going to talk um, well, about all kinds of stuff in her work. It's amazing, amazing, heroic uh, Morgantowner gone out in the world doing all kinds of great stuff in science education. And uh, we're going to come back, we're going to talk to uh, three classroom teachers and researchers in the climate area who work here in West Virginia. We'll be back in 15 minutes. You can register outside. There's lots of coffee and danishes and all that stuff out there. <laughs>